We now go to the Leader of the Opposition, Right Honourable Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by sending my best wishes to the Prime Minister and all those across the country who are doing the right thing by following the rules and self-isolating? Mr Speaker, devolution in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is one of the proudest achievements of the last Labour government. Until now, whatever our disagreements, there has been a very broad consensus about devolution. So why did the Prime Minister tell his MPs this week that Scottish devolution is, in his words, a disaster? Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think what has unquestionably been a disaster is the way in which the Scottish Nationalist Party have taken and used devolution as a, as a means not to improve the lives of their constituents, not to address their, uh, their health concerns, not to improve uh, education in Scotland, but constantly, and I know this is actually a point of view that is shared uh, by the right honourable gentleman who leads uh, for the opposition, uh, but constantly to campaign for the breakup of our country and to turn devolution otherwise a sound policy from which I myself personally uh, benefited by uh, when I was running London, but turned devolution into a mission uh, to break up the UK. And that, in my view, would be a disaster. If he, if he doesn't think that would be a disaster, then perhaps he could say so now. Could, 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 could I just say it's the Scottish National Party, not the Nationalist Party? Otherwise, the phones will be ringing longer than I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. The national, but not nationalists, I see. Right. We can play pedantics another time. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, the singest big threat, biggest threat to the future of the United Kingdom is the Prime Minister every time he opens his mouth on this. When the Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister said he wanted to take back control, nobody thought he meant from the Scottish people. But the Prime Minister's quote is very clear. He said devolution has been a disaster north of the border. This isn't an isolated incident, whether it's the internal market bill, the way the Prime Minister sidelined the devolved parliaments over the Covid response, the Prime Minister is seriously undermining the fabric of the United Kingdom. So instead of talking down devolution, does he agree that we need far greater devolution of powers and resources across the United Kingdom? We don't go back. Well, Prime Minister. I mean, Mr Speaker, I think it, it is, it's... Uh, Tony Blair himself, uh, the, the former Labour leader, who has conceded that he did not foresee the rise of a separatist uh, party uh, he, in Scotland. He did not foresee the collapse of, of Scottish Labour, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, I think the right honourable gentleman is quite right. There can be uh, great advantages in devolution. And I was very proud uh, when I was running a, a devolved administration in London to do things in which I passionately believed like improving public transport and fighting crime and improving housing for my constituents. And we had a great deal of success. And what disappoints me is that the Scottish National Party, Mr Speaker, and I abide by your, uh, your, your ruling on their correct uh, name, and the Scottish National Party, Mr Speaker, is, is not engaging in that basic work. Instead, they are campaigning to break up the union, an objective that I hope uh, the Leader of the Opposition will repudiate. Uh, will he say so now that he opposes the breakup of the United Kingdom? It, it's not a ruling, it's a matter of fight. Kirsten. Of course I don't want the breakup of the Union, the United Kingdom. But if anything, if anything is fueling that breakup, it's the Prime Minister. <laughs> turning, turning now to the Prime Minister's handling of the pandemic, the Prime Minister is doing the right thing by self-isolating after being notified by track and trace. But does he think he would have been able to do so if, like so many other people across the country, all he had to rely on for the next 14 days was either statutory sick pay, which is £95 a week, that's £13 a day, or a one-off payment of £500, which works out at £35 a day? Prime Minister. Well, uh, it, it's good, finally, to uh, hear something from the right on gentleman praise of NHS test and trace. I think they uh, secured uh, at least one of his objectives, which keep me away from, on, uh, from answering his questions in, in person. Uh, what I can say to him is that uh, I believe that the package that we have in place to protect people and support people throughout this crisis has been outstanding and uh, exceptional. I think that the UK has uh, put its arms, as I've 
uh, said many times around the people of this country, a £200 billion package of support, increasing the living wage by record amounts, uplifting uh, universal credit, uh, many, many loans and grants to businesses uh, of all kinds, and support for people who are self-isolating, uh, £500 uh, of support in addition to all the other, uh, all the other benefits uh, and support that we give. I do think it's a, a reasonable package, Mr Speaker. I know it's tough uh, for people who have to self-isolate, and I'm glad that uh, after a long time in which he simply attacked NHS uh, tests and trace, he seems now to be coming around and supporting it. Yes, Starmer. Mr Speaker, I'm not going to take lectures on supporting. The lockdown measures were passed the other week with Labour votes. 32 of his own MPs broke a three-line whip, and I hear that about 50 of them have joined a WhatsApp group to work out how they're going to oppose him next time round. He should be thanking us for our support, not criticising. And as he well knows, so far as the £500 scheme is concerned, only one in eight workers qualifies for that scheme. The Prime Minister always does this, talking about the number of people he's helping, but ignoring the huge numbers falling through the gap. Members here may be able to afford to self-isolate, but that's not the case for many people across the country who send us here. It's estimated that only about 11% of people self-isolate when they're asked to do so. 11%. That isn't because they don't want to. It's because many don't feel that they can afford to. So, for example, if you're a self-employed plumber, a construction worker, a photographer, and you don't qualify for social security benefits, or you run a small business and you can't work from home, you're likely to see a significant cut to your income if you have to self-isolate. This is affecting many families across the country. Does the Prime Minister recognise that if we want to increase the number of people who isolate, we need to make it easier and affordable for people to do so? Going back to the Prime Minister. Yeah, M M Mr Speaker, uh, again, I, I do think that it is uh, extraordinary that he's now uh, coming out in favour of NHS tests and trace when uh, he's continuously attacked it. In fact, the numbers that he gives for the success rate of NHS, uh, of, of the self-isolation programme, uh, in, uh, according to my information, way too low. Uh, but we continue to encourage people to do the right thing. It, it does break the chain of transmission of the of the disease. And as for the self-employed groups that he uh, mentions, we've given £13.5 billion pounds so far in support for self-employed people, uh, uplifted universal credit uh, in the way that I have described. And what we want to do is to get the virus under control, get the R down uh, below one, which is the purpose of these current measures, uh, encourage people to self-isolate in the way that, uh, that I am, uh, thereby stop the disease from spreading, so that uh, the firms, the professions, the, the businesses that he, he talks about can get back to, their, uh, to something as close to normality as soon as possible. In the meantime, we are giving them every possible support, Mr Speaker. Here's Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister must understand there's a huge gap in the system, because if you can't afford to isolate, there's little point in being tested or traced. And whilst the Prime Minister and Chancellor won't pay people enough to isolate properly, we learnt this week that they can find £21 million of taxpayers' money to pay a go-between to deliver lucrative contracts to the Department of Health. £21 million. I remind the Prime Minister that a few weeks ago he couldn't find that amount of money for free school meals for kids over half term. Does the Prime Minister think that £21 million to a middleman was an acceptable use of taxpayers' money? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, when this crisis began, we were being urged by the right honourable gentleman to remove the blockages in our procurement uh, process in order to get PPE. And we were facing, as, as he will remember, a very difficult situation where across the world there were, there were not adequate supplies of PPE. Nobody had uh, enough PPE. We shifted heaven and earth to get 32 billion items of PPE into this country. I'm very proud of what has been achieved. 70% of PPE is now made in this country or capable of being made in this country when it was only 1% at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. And it's entirely uh, typical, I may say, of uh, of, of Captain Hindsight, that he now attacks our efforts to, to procure PPE, uh, says we, we went too fast, uh, when uh, he now says that uh, we, we oh, says, says then that we were not going fast enough, but now says uh, that we went too fast. He should make his mind up. Keir Starmer. He talks about hindsight. I say catch up. I called for a circuit breaker. 
The Prime Minister stood there and said it'd be a disaster, he wasn't going to do it. Then he caught up and did exactly that just a few weeks later. We've now got a longer, harder lockdown as a result of his delay, so I won't take that from him. Last week, the Prime Minister couldn't explain, he couldn't explain how his government ended up paying £150 million on contracts that didn't deliver a single piece of usable PPE. This week, he's effectively defending the paying of £21 million on a contract with no oversight. This morning, the Independent National Audit Office concluded that the government's approach was, in their words, diminished public transparency. They reported that more than half of all contracts relating to the pandemic, Mr Speaker, that's totalling £10.5 billion, were handed out without competitive tender, and that suppliers with political connections were ten times more likely to be awarded contracts. Mr Speaker, we're eight months into this crisis, and the Government is still making the same mistakes. Can the Prime Minister give a cast-iron assurance that from now on, from now on, all Government contracts will be subject to proper process with full transparency and accountability. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, all government contracts are, of course, going to be published in the, uh, in the due way and are, are already uh, being published. But again, I must say, I think it's extraordinary that uh, he now attacks the government for securing PPE in huge quantities. And I, I want to thank again all the people who are involved in that effort, uh, Lord Dighton, literally thousands of others who built up a mountain of PPE against uh, any further crisis. And uh, he talks about uh, transparency and, and moving uh, too fast to secure uh, contracts. As you should know, the shadow chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster actually uh, wrote to the government attacking them us for failing to approach various companies, including a football agent uh, who was apparently offering to supply ventilators, and a historical clothing manufacturing company who, uh, who apparently make a, who's offering to make 175 gowns per week and whose current uh, range includes uh, 16th century silk bodices. Uh, again, Mr Speaker, you know, at the time uh, he bashed the government uh, for not moving fast enough, uh, it's absolutely absurd that he's now cap in hindsight, he's now once again uh, trying to score party political points, score political points by attacking us for moving too fast. I'm proud of what we did to secure huge quantities of PPE 